now, our feature presentation. time you are listening to this interview which is exciting because this is the first interview of 2022 in my personal favorite month october spooky season and i've got a special guest on with me who i'm super excited to have on because her name has come up before on the podcast if you've listened to any of the episodes that i've done with mr sam rosenthal from black tape for a blue girl you would have heard the name Vicki Richards. She is a, an amazing musician, violin extraordinaire, especially the electric violin. She's also a composer. She's an educator, an arranger. I don't know what she hasn't done, but she's on the podcast today. Vicki Richards, welcome in. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Um, I thank you for your pumpkins in the background. It's very festive. <laughs> So are you a fan of October yourself? I'm a fan of all of October. I mean, all of autumn. And it just started here where I am. And I love it. It's refreshing. I would love to find a place in this world where you can live and it's autumn all year round. Does that even exist? Oh, my gosh. What a concept. <laughs> no, it sounds like a good title for a piece of music. Yeah, that would be. That... A lot of them, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's super exciting to have you on. Uh, you have a 40 plus year career. So there's all so much to cover. Let's talk about some of your early years. Where did it all start for you? Where did you grow up and all that? Okay, the beginnings. I just uh, thank you, public school system in the state of Rhode Island. Oh my gosh, I had no clue I was going to be a musician. I I didn't have access to instruments, and they handed me this wooden box, you know, with a you know, squeaky sounding thing. And someone, uh, one of the music teachers, uh, told my parents uh, he could do well with private lessons, and that was the beginning. And I didn't really care much about it. It was just something to do. It was like a homework task. I'd rather be outside playing or, you know, like most kids, you run around, make noise. So I was in there trying to teach me music. It took a long time. But in that uh, Providence school system, um, I think it's important that we keep the arts open for kids. You never know where the talents lie. And uh, we have to keep that open and fund it like other countries do. Just putting in a plug there. <laughs> Did you have a teacher growing up or maybe more than just one who was just so impactful in your early years? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. He's on my wall. I have a, a picture of him. It's not a great picture, but Martin Fisher, um, uh, the, a professor of music at Brown University. I don't know why he took me on. I mean, I was just, you know, he's used to college kids and stuff, but I was a kid and he saw potential and all his Eastman School of Music training gave me all the technique over lots of years, lots of years. And that whole course of study through concertos um, to get you ready for conservatory <laughs> or music school. Yeah. And there was a time when he and my mother, um, who was a single parent by then, uh, were sit discussing Curtis Institute of Music, which music school conservatory for our kids around age 12 or 13 and I wasn't ready for that I didn't want to go now I was having a great time because we had moved to a rural part of Rhode Island there were horses there was nature my mother I have to thank her rest her soul she got me to my lessons way over on the other side of the state um, until I could take a bus and was old enough to figure out how to do that from some location uh, yeah, so he hung in with me, even in those teenage years, which are, oh, I was much more interested in other things. The, you know, good educators, very good educators. I, I got fortunate um, 
in those beginnings. And then I, I did get to train a little bit with uh, the senior Henrik Kowalski, a Polish violinist who came into Rhode Island um, when I was a late teenager. And at that time, uh, Dr. Fisher, he said, I've taken you as far as I can. He can take you farther. Farther. So I had some lessons with him. I got into Indiana University, Oberlin, or, you know, pretty much wherever I was going. So that's so that's that's a, a long span of playing scales and doing arpeggios and uh, Shevchik and Shradek, all the the names of those uh, technical drills. Did you grow up listening to a lot of classical music, or were you also listening to a lot of the music of the era on the pop side, radio, that sort of thing too? I lived remote. For me to hear a symphony. During the lesson day down in Providence, I went to the library to go in a listening room, checking out, what was that, a 78 or an LP to hear Beethoven's Third Eroica Symphony so that I would know what it sounded like or to hear a concerto. There were no live concerts. I was remote and the radio didn't supply much where we were and my mother had a few recordings and there was you know resources were few in my family so it's not like you could go out and buy a record unless you worked enough to do that and could get transportation so I, I kind of missed out on my generation for a while and then I made up for it later in life and um, you know by listening to a lot more of Jimi Hendrix and I got Led Zeppelin fever real late of course Mahavishnu Orchestra it it was it was too much for me. I did hear them live, and I was too young. I I don't know how I got downtown to hear them, and I had to leave the concert because it was a wall of sound I had never heard, and I didn't know what was going on, and it 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 was irritating, and I had to leave in a cloud of confusion the first time. Where did you see them? Uh, they're in Providence. That I don't. I'm not sure. Maybe a college brought them in. Okay. I probably didn't tell my mother where I was going. I was driving age. It's like, <gasps> so I, uh, that was the first time a year later though, I got it. I got part of it and I went, oh, more mind blowing stuff. I think my life has been a series of light bulb moments. Wow. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking at this time. At what point did you get down to South Florida? This has been fascinating to to figure out why would I go to Miami? It was never on my map as places to go. I'm, you know, New Englander. It's, I need seasons. <laughs> so uh, I met Jerry Gentry at Indiana University. He was a vibes player in the jazz department and percussion. I was classical. He said, sit in on David Baker's jazz class. And I'm the only violin player. I didn't still didn't know what was going on. Okay. So then we came back and formed the, this, this group, uh, Jerry Gentry Quintet lots of percussion, and I, I couldn't be heard. I had this microphone, and you couldn't hear me over all that percussion, and we needed to eat. We needed to play out, so what was I going to do? There were no violins that were electric. You couldn't buy an electric violin. People would think you're crazy, so I had one made. Thank you, Carl Dennis, a luthier extraordinaire, and then I could crank it up to 11 if I needed to, so there we are. Um, I got to New York. Oh, by the luck of the draw, the, the funding for arts organizations was coming into the city that year, um, CETA, C -E -T -A, and I auditioned for a couple spots, and I got the one with the American Jewish Congress's Contemporary Music Ensemble because I could play electric, I could improvise, I could play classical, I could write music, and, you know, and, and the different venues I got to play with all those uh, contemporary music series like Milton Babbitt, the composer, would often come into New York and he'd need a pickup orchestra to, you know, play one of his pieces. And I got to do that. I got to premiere uh, at the Academy of Music, Brooklyn Music School. Anyway, we go to India, we get a grant, and which is not easy, but we did. I'm exposed to Indian music for a year. And I, I'm quizzical, you know, I'm going to like, huh? What is this? Like a Scooby-Doo moment. What is this? What is this? I know what he's doing a little bit. That whole world of raga system, I had a teacher and there's no sheet music. There, you sit to have a lesson. There's no music stand. There's no sheet music. You're sitting on the floor cross-legged and learning to kind of memorize 
this new structure and system that gives you the opportunity to play like for 45 minutes by yourself. And it's fresh daily. You make it fresh daily, very little composed part. So I'm learning and I'm young enough, I hope, to I learn a little of the language, but the language of music, it's still, I kind of got, it takes about a year. The first raga you learn with all, I'm gonna say six movements and the structuring of it, in improvisation, learning to improvise, how am I going to get back to India? I need more. There's this wonderful violin teacher, Dr. N. Rajam. How can I get there? Can I get a grant? No, you need to finish your degree to get that grant. Okay, where can I go back to school? And there wasn't, you know, there are some places that, that no one was as open as University of Miami in the string department. It was on a lark during probably a Thanksgiving where my mother-in-law said, well, you were, I don't know, just why don't you just go play for the violin professor? And I'm thinking, well, okay. And uh, they offered me a full scholarship and that's nothing to, you know, you, you don't just let that go. And I went, oh, I said, yeah, but I, I play electric. I'm a professional already. I play classical. I need to gig, I this and this and this, and I need housing you know, things like that, because I knew what rents were in New York. I figured Miami's probably going to be like that. But it, so things got arranged well enough. Asked my uh, husband, do, do you mind if we move to Miami? <laughs> you know, and he said, no, I got lots of family. That's where his mother is. He's got some siblings. And it's like, okay. So that's, it was out of necessity. It was a six-year plan since I, from going to India, coming back, getting a scholarship, going back to school for a couple of years, applying for a grant, and finally landing with the premier teacher on violin in India. But the journey woo, was great because I bumped into those Miami musicians. I was very happy to have Thomas Moore as my professor. And he he gave me some contemporary music. I, he, he was great. I, I appreciated what he did for me. And in Miami, also thanks to another organization in South Florida, I'd like to mention, is PACE, Performing Arts for Community and Education. We met with them before we moved. We're playing our Indian music, and they said, we have a place for you here. We, we will be able to um, present you and have gigs and, you know, supplement what you're doing. And it was uh, terrific to have opportunities to play around town, and especially when the band Amazon formed with Bobby Thomas Jr. and Amit Chatterjee, um, Tim Richards, David Einhorn was in the beginning. So I learned along the way when I went to present at ASTA, the American String Teachers Association, they opened up finally to non-classical styles. And I was there in that uh, inaugural year. Mark O'Connor was there, Christian House, Julie Lyon Lieberman, she organized this. Uh, it was all of a sudden, all the spices of the world, it wasn't just salt and pepper anymore. And, and we were the spice that they brought in. And each gives a 30-second clip. And I also met Mark Wood, fabulous rocker. Everybody's got Juilliard training or conservatory training, but he went the rock route. And um, I don't have a violin, but I had a solid body electric flying V that he built later. And it did not involve the neck. It just kind of hung there. And... Um, we're all connected in some way. And when you resonate with musicians or dancers or people, it's the, uh, what, the sum is greater than the number of parts. Uh, there's that uh, explosion of creativity that, that is in, can be enormous. I don't know. There's something that light bulb moments, dead composers and live musicians like Bobby Thomas, <laughs> who plays... Yeah, you know, like un unlike anyone else on the planet. And Bobby Thomas also played with one of the most well-known jazz fusion groups out there, Weather Report. Yes, way back. He sure did. And it was, I, I asked him about this recently in preparation. I said, how did you come to find us in Miami? Uh, where, what were you, why were you, who were you looking for? He said, well, Joe Zawinall, the leader, said that I ought to go play tabla. And he said something like that. And the only Tabla teacher in town was uh, Tim Richards. So we met that way and found that we we started playing together. 
very soon and shortly thereafter. I, I'm not sure if he learned tabla for, for long, but we, we're in family. I, he's also godfather of my kids. And um, he uh, also brought through uh, Jaco Pastorius, his wife, Ingrid, loaned me, I think it was a koto or a gushin, gushin, after Jaco's passing. I never met Jaco Pastorius, but, you know, listened later in life just to hear, well, what was he doing? What was he doing? Right. Um, you know, sometimes I think it, it's kind of, it might be a good thing in some ways that I didn't have so much access to everybody else's playing. I have my voice that developed, you know, I had enough influence from all the training, but um, I thought, well, if I listened to too many violin players, maybe I would have sounded just like them, like another clone, or I could play the covers and I'm sure, which is fun because they're recognizable tunes. I've only played a few recognizable tunes um, as an experiment to see if an audience would enjoy that or just watch us kind of go out into the stratosphere together. What would be one of the covers you would play? Um, oh, God. Uh, Sting, the police is fragile. Fragile. Mm. Uh, how fragile we are. And I think that piece is um, is a Russian... Comp there's that this... A bomb. Is a Russian composer's theme, and that's beautiful. And the sentiment is beautiful. You know, the the world is fragile. We all love our children. You know, so it was. A, it meant a lot to me as a mother, as a person on the planet. And then for fun, I challenged myself to try to make an arrangement with, uh, you know, on violin you have single notes usually. And I, there are double stops. You can play sometimes two at a time. I tried to make an arrangement of uh, Lucy and Linus, Vince Guaraldi's da 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 ba da 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 da, because it's a, it's happy. I just want to bring a little bit of happy out there and see if anyone knows what I'm doing. And uh, and then I was playing with um, our origins of getting to Miami with uh, Jeff Dean, whose name is Jahidi, and with Mitch Kopp on. Uh, he he did us. A remarkable job on guitar. He also has a, a a music shop in Miami or north of there. Finger tapping. Yeah, so that we had another. A, I had a different, different people, different times. We're all influential and sparked my music. As do Navajo canyons. As does a particular monastery in Spain, Montserrat. I've had experiences that were influential. There's like something wants, there's something to be had. There's a, a picture. There's a, what canvas can I make? And people have helped me. Frank Carmel Latano was on uh, on the recording. Satoshi Takeshi, um, Frank guitarist, vocalist. He's, I think he's still playing in the Keys and in, uh, around town in Miami. And he plays keyboards. We've worked on a lot of projects. And if you ever see, not exactly self-promotion, but whatever. It's a, a channel 17 WLRN way back in last century, must have been near the 80s because I got big hair. And uh, we are doing that piece, Cold Rain of Autumn, just Frank, Satoshi, and I, and we are just, um, it's so tight. It's so precise. The speed is so fast. We're burning it. We are really burning and we're in great shape to do it. Um, and it has elements of Indian music. There's a raga in there. There's there's Western harmonization on the album later that I overdub. Anyway, so there, I've got a lot of names out there. Enrico, Enrique Gardano also. It's the only time I've ever played Get Up Off of That Thing. James uh, Brown? Yeah, playing with my bass pedal on and, and a wah. Yes, thank you. So everyone brings something different. Oh, yeah, I love it. that. There's another venue, a small venue downtown Miami. It's a gallery. It's an art gallery. So there were a few places to play to try things out. And the Musicians Exchange up in Fort Lauderdale. And there's a picture I might have sent you. I'm wearing sunglasses. I don't know if I'm wearing a jumpsuit or what. Um, it's on uh, playing. And we're just, it's Amazon. The band that did not get to travel except to Paris once to do some recording. Yeah, we needed better management. We need to manage, we, we, but once you have children, things change. Too. Yeah, uh, I see the I see that book in the background. It says 
I think drum drummers when the women were drummers. Oh, ah, okay. Yeah. I did notice that. Let me see. Uh, this was by Lane Redman and she's a, a frame drummer. She, she's just been inducted into the percussive art society hall of fame. She's no longer with us on the planet too. She, she passed some years ago in history. She brought in this, this volume up to light that the women were drummers in prehistory. And they were the ones in charge of drumming. And she brought that back. We, we've we done, I played music for her. I'm on a couple of her recordings. Each time was so different. Um, the last time I went down to Brazil when she was living there and she said, I, will, I want to do this. And, and I heard what she was doing. She's another person who gave me free reign and it worked and it, it became um, atmospheric. There was an atmospheric loop. So I, I made more loops like that. I've even brought that loop into hospital situations to surgical floors uh, with another musician once. And they said, blood pressures went down, pain levels went down, whatever it was. I don't know, but I'm always thankful to be a channel if that's what it is. And so she gave me opportunities to learn um, you know, when, when she's talking about Greece and Greek playing, can you play anything like a Greek violin? I'm going, well, I'm from another, the other ancient culture I can play is Indian, but um, I listened to some players and I, I didn't do it well, but I said, we're just going to have more, more trills, more flight, what sounds like flight patterns. How about that? So uh, she was always encouraging. Um, so the, the other women, I was thinking, about this, like who can I who can I point out? Julie Lyon Lieberman, a violinist. She's an extraordinary multi-styled virtuoso and educator who has brought a lot of music to a lot of people um, through her her summer programs and at getting the American String Teachers Association to let in what they started calling the alternative styles group which is the rest of the world that's not classical, you know, classical Western. So she, in a way, put me on the map. She included me in her first book, Improvising Violin. So I'm alongside in that book, El Shankar is there from South India. Mark Wood is there. They're just the people who started to play in a different way. And I came in as a Westerner playing music of North India. So I, I'm always grateful for her inclusion on anything because she does it with integrity and well. And so I, I need to, you know, give her a shout out. Um, I'm, I'm looking at one more book because when Julie's um, summer program called Strings Without Boundaries, uh, one summer I, I was on to teach in Pittsburgh. Alongside me, she brought Richard Green, the extremely excellent fiddler who was uh Oh my gosh, C train. He was there and I I started to learn how to do the chop. It's a technique on violin that is kind of new for violin playing and it, it gives you the ability to do rhythm like a like a rhythm guitarist. Um so I was glad to see him uh C train if anybody knows. Um I have a couple other women just to to shout out because I never get a chance to do this and um on um uh, this is like Ravel. There were snippets of Ravel on this one. And I, I brought in some ladies to play in a string quartet. And it was kind of amazing that I met one of them up here in the mountains. Uh, she relocated and said, hey, I never got a copy. I went, oh, my gosh. You know, uh, so I, I gave her a copy. And I remember I said, we were a string quartet and we just had no name. It was just for the session because I knew they were all great players. So that was uh, Miriam Stern, Debbie Spring, and Luisa Bustamante. However, there were some secrets going on during that session. And I think it added to the energy, the charge of us playing together so well right away, like first take. Um, two of them were pregnant. So we had mama energy in there big time going. So we had a sextet, you know. Uh, so I wanted to point that out. It's, it was just one of those fun things. Another South Florida, um, one of uh, the most bizarre types of gigs I've ever played happened in Miami. 
the construction of the, the Arsht Center, the two buildings are happening. They're in mid-construction and they're going to have a, a street festival, even though you can't go inside yet. And I get a call from Gustavo Matamoros of the Subtropics Music Festival. It's a, a it's new music. It's improvised. It's experimental music. And he was hired to produce um, music for this giant event. It was called Cars and Fish. He apparently methodically microphone checked with microphones the pitches of the building exterior that would be bouncing between. There is a pedestrian bridge that he would be on with a with his board and monitor. We had to climb up on scaffolding on the side of the streets um, and have someone hand the instruments up to uh, be ready to play with what we had pre-recorded with him. And he then edited, chopped, spliced, inverted, put upside down. We didn't know what was going to happen. It was experimental. In the meantime, at night, on the side of the building, uh, the the video, the filming of fish, sea level, we're right down by the bay and cars going by. So there was uh, also a filmmaker involved and I was trying to look at it, but pay attention to what's going on because we're responding to that. The trombone player across the street on sca scaffolding, the guitarist, it was kind of wild. And then the parade starts and people are on stilts and people are in slow motion. It was an event like unlike any other that I've had to be part of. There's probably a video out there for any one of your listeners to go look at. If you want something really amazing, take a look at that. And Mary Luft, another woman, um, Mary Luft had um, a performance series going for many, many years called Tiger Tail Productions. And one year she brought a, a wonderful conductor up. Um, I'm going to get the country wrong, Brazil. And she created uh, the Nervous City Orchestra for Miami. But there were different levels of training and skill and cultures all in one room and getting us to all pitch in, create our parts, having a loose structure, but interlocking at certain places. I can do this. I can do this. What would you like? So I ended up playing a part of uh, The Devil Went Down to Georgia, you know, and that, 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 that part, the violin part, and, you know, and then Indian music and another part. And a bandoneon player would come in and just different cultural influences. I, that's another, I felt like I was at the UN in a way of all of the United Nations, um, ununited maybe at times, but that was the thrill of it. Like, can we actually get to the end together? because things will change in the middle. So you have to be ready and aware. What I like is that I do have that, my part that I wrote out my notes, which they kept those parts for a while. I think they wanted to document just how differently we might write music or put notation in or not notation, you know? And um, so I have that copy, which is unique. You get to keep your own part that you develop for yourself within guidelines, a few guidelines, not too many. So Mary Luft did that. Dale Andre was a choreographer, is a choreographer and a teacher in New World School of the Arts. And also when I got to town, she was um, director of Mary Street Dance Theater. Working with a choreographer is so much fun. And she had me doing different things. She really had a creative spirit and and I was there on the inaugural. Um, I created some music for that. We were down at the Deering Estate in South Florida by the water. And things you don't expect to happen in rehearsal, one of which is the sound of, <sighs> what's that? It's an inhalation. Wait a minute. My partner, Jeff, is not inhaling. I'm not, what is it? It's a manatee. There's a manatee behind us who surfaced to see what's going on, I guess. And just like, what are you guys doing? Whoa, sea cow. Maybe so, you wanted to hear what was happening, you know? I guess so. It's like, that's yeah. odd. It, food? Got food? <laughs> um, and the last time I played for her was with Bobby Thomas. I, I asked, I said, could we get him? There's a special, you know, he's got a drum machine. We can do this and, and this and that. And that. it's always fun over in Parrot Jungle, where, where it used to be Parrot Jungle. There's a performing space. So if people know that area, maybe they can relate to that. Maybe they were there. 
I haven't been there in some years, but I remember the the shifts and changes. Oh, and that there's a new performing art center down in South Dade, which um, is doing remarkable. Um, so I saw things shift over 25 years. I saw a lot of things changing. Uh, the Arsh Center went up, yay. Um, my favorite and first CD recording was on, um, at least rehearsals, were on stage at University of Miami's Gusman Hall, which is my favorite theater of that size. It's wood floors, great acoustics. The engineering department is excellent. And speaking of engineers, the primary engineer for most of the recordings, I'm looking at the wall because I finally got them out of the box, um, was Peter Yanalos of Artisan Recorders. And um, he, I think, was the first one who I worked with in Criteria Studios in North Miami. But I remember starting to record with him for Amazon when he was working out of his house or through it with his truck. He has a giant recording mobile truck. Um, having an engineer with excellent ears is so critical. And I learned a lot. I think this being in the studio recording is my, one of my favorite places to be on the planet. You know, it's great. And looking through the, the seeing your part, if you can still see the person you're locking in with, you know, even if it's a glass barrier, it's, um, it's a chance to take that um, generally spontaneous and ever changing improvisational nature and lock it down for that moment you get it that one time, it's only going to be that way once. So if you get a, a really, uh, that first take is usually it, uh, you know, or just move on to something. Right. Else. So I loved learning about that. Um, thank, I have to thank University of Miami for letting me a performance major into recording 101, <laughs> into that class. Um, it, it was going to get hard toward the end with the math, but I said, I want to know the difference between the mics. I need to know what goes on in a studio so I can speak to the engineer. What if they don't play violin? What if they don't did they don't know what side of the room you're supposed to be on? What you know if you're in a quartet? So I needed some language and uh, I passed probably barely, but I got. The <laughs> <laughs> I mean, barely is still passing, right? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Because that long trajectory is like, I really want to get back to India. And I did. I haven't talked about that woman yet. Um, that that teacher, Dr. N. Rajam, is a, uh, a remarkable person and a player. And she taught me a lot of things that were musical and not musical. Because um, I'd say, why are you going to play at at this little temple over here. She's used to doing the biggest concert stages and, you know, all India radio. And she said, well, I always play for God. That's who I'm playing for. And if the audience enjoys it, that's that's nice too. I went, oh, it's that connection. And there was another mind blowing moment for this Westerner, this foreigner in India, which was uh, negotiating over fees to pay your music teacher. Um, usually, my experience is uh, there. Uh, there's an hourly class, and there's a you know a fee that goes down. Everyone knows you just you know pay, and then you go home and you go do your life. Uh, it's not quite that way in India. Um, I went to see her that first trip, and she heard me play, and that was nice. She didn't really say she'd take me on as a full time student, but then she came on tour to the United States. She came to Miami and we spent him and I had um, an in, the Indian Music Foundation and we would bring in artists and nonprofit and we would um, uh, also arrange for workshops and classes so that they could teach people individually. So she came through town with her daughter, who's a wonderful violinist and uh, but was a kid, just a teenager. I was in married student housing. She came up to that little apartment. She saw, she met my in-laws, one of whom was an Episcopal bishop. She saw that I was a serious student. I was not a hippie going to India to smoke grass and hang out on the Ganges River. She had to see this, that I was serious because why would she waste her time? You know, she's got concerts to do and, and upper level students to teach and why, you know, you only have so much time. So I, there I am, I have the grant, I have a stipend, I can, I can pay whatever. 
So I go in and said, well, I know you're going to see me every day. Thank you for setting me up in housing on the university campus. And that's great. And I'll see you every day. Wow. How much is, do I pay for a lesson? She said something like, what is the value of it to you? What's it worth to you? That's not a number. What? <laughs> it's like, what? what? Well, this is, a, this is a lineage of music making. And this is um, a very important um, choice that you've made here. And what what is the value? Like, what could you pay me? I'm thinking, what, $1,000 an hour? I don't know. I don't know what I said, but it was sort of startling to hear that uh, the, that money buying a lesson going home wasn't what the Indian tradition is about. It, it's you, she becomes your your guruji. You it, with uh, at least with the sitar teacher. Yes, you can bind in a ceremony to become the student of that teacher. You are family, and you usually don't exchange money until maybe or presents until Guru Purnima, full moon in July, where your revered teachers get acknowledgement and and you can give them money if you want it you know keeps their household going but it's it's not a fee for service wow that it's mind blowing so um my um husband of the time tim richards his tradition with the tabla teacher pandit charda sahai also had that same model but he didn't tell me about it cuz he was used to it uh, and i watched i said oh there's responsibility on both ends of this relationship and if they need help, you help, you make concerts. If you need help, they're going to um, do this for you. It, it became family. And I, it was a privilege. And I realized I had a responsibility to learn well so that one member of an audience in India came up to me, at least well, a couple, they loved us playing Indian music in India. He said, I hear your teacher. That's the biggest compliment that they hear you're being true to that style. And she's doing vocal style, which is a uh, gamaka vocal. It's not just finger stopping, it's sliding. It was a mind blower. So I I spoke better about that when I did some college, uh, you know, uh, did some lecturing at colleges and, and lecture demo. I mean, just listening to that whole experience and all that went in, I'm sure there's a lot of gaps and stuff that we could probably talk for hours just about your time in India. Uh, yeah. What were what were the drawbacks for you as well as a Westerner being there? What were some of those moments that you may have had? You were like, hmm, I don't know how I'm feeling about this. Yeah, well, thanks for, for knowing that it, it was difficult. It was a culture shock, number one. Uh, it was, uh, I got sick. Um, you know, I'm saying I, uh, <laughs> for music, I put my liver on the line. I got hepatitis. <laughs> so, and I came back and eventually recovered, but like, wow, there were, there were just different things that you could get, um, uh, because the water was different. You had to boil water and hope for the best, never have ice. There were just things to learn about. And, you know, you had to remain modestly dressed, when I went back on my own for after graduating, after waiting for the grant, I was on my own. I did not have a, a, a partner with me or your husband. And I said, I'm going to New Delhi on the train from Banaras, Varanasi, India, because there's this all night festival for three days. Some of the best musicians of India are going to be there. Here's my chance. You're going alone? Yeah, I'm going to the concerts. I'm on a train. I said, no, what? You're going... You should take somebody. I said, look, I'm big, I'm strong. I, I'm I'm taller than a lot of the people that I see here. And I'm, you know, I'm capable. And I had confidence, maybe a little naivete about that. Um, I think someone probably put a blessing on me. I was fine, but I understand there can be some trouble from men when there are women single women around. Gee, where else does that happen? Oh, <laughs> any place, most places. A place is not safe until the women say it is. I've heard that before. And it's just, it's just absolutely true. Um, I have a ritual of things that I would do before recording to and the day before and to try to keep distractions out so I could just put on those headphones. I definitely know the feeling of having rituals before and after you do certain things. So I totally get that. And I wanted to shift gears a little bit. It does relate to your time in Miami. 
but I know Vicky, you also had done some violin work with Slap, Stephen Nestor, in the mid '80s. I want to say so. Can you talk a little bit about how you linked up with him and some of your memories of working with Slap? Gosh, you know, if I I don't know how it started. I don't know if Sam Rosenthal was part of that. But we didn't live far apart. All of a sudden, we're only blocks away from each other in South Miami once, I guess, I was out of school. And it's not what you call melodic. No, it's not. There's no melody. So I'm a single line melody player. So what was I doing? I probably something electric. Um, But one night, we had to go play in the Mutiny Hotel for a leather show, um, which is also was an icon for certain kind of events and on, you know, goings on in the 80s in Coconut Grove. And it was an eyeful for me. Maybe we were in a club, some off the beaten path club. And I'm not sure. I said, wow, what's another weird gig? Another weird gig. But we recorded and he's really artistic. You know, the Polaroids, he made me giant size that my girls want to keep. I said, oh, I don't know if you want to carry it around. I said, yeah, but he captured something there we want. You know, and most people say, I can't tell it's you. I can't see the bow. I said, look, there's the bow. He was kind of a a, um, a wild person, I'd say. He just, uh, it was just kind of wild in some ways. Really sweet daughter. I think you mentioned prior to our interview as well. You, yeah. If you could bring it up again, that would be wonderful. But your first cassette tape, <laughs> that, that, uh, that the one that's the rarest that uh, no one has, but I think you and Sam Rosenthal, right? So... <laughs> Yeah, that's the one that uh, Stephen Nestor also that's had a me. part in it. Yeah. Yes, yes, that's right. So he was, yeah, I think that's on the credits. Tiny, this is such a small place to put things, but yeah, he's there. And well, after recording with him, there would be champagne. Yeah, there would be champagne. <laughs> and we were both home, so close to home. It was okay. <laughs> And then I, you know, like after a drink or two, then I'm, I'm out, you know, and he can continue. I don't, you know, I, I just, I can't tolerate that much. It must've been India and that whole thing with the liver. I don't know. <laughs> Learn, <laughs> I just, learned, have no capacity. Right. Learned your lesson from that experience. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So he was another fascinating personality in South Miami. You know, they were, that was South Miami. I'm sure there were a lot of interesting characters in Miami at that time. Now, Vicky, I have to let you know, I don't know if I told you this already, but the first time I ever heard any of your playing was on a black tape for a blue girl, Chaos of Desire. That was the first time I ever heard you are playing. Sam Rosenthal, who's been a guest of the podcast, both him and Oscar Herrera, we're on together as well. Perhaps you can share some memories of Black Tape for Blue Girl and partnering with Sam Rosenthal. Um, I'm glad you asked. Um, before I even talk about the music, Sam at Project has been the best, I don't I, I was going to say businessman, the way of conducting business with equality for all and sharing the royalties in making payments on time. I mean, often when I've played with other people, there's no acknowledgement. Your name may or may not get on tracks. You probably won't get paid. Um, And you don't know where your stuff's gone. Your your best work, maybe, who knows? You do your best every time you sit down on a spec kind of job. But he he really, um, he had a vision and he had lyrics. And I'm not a, a person that really listens to music with lyrics um, in, in the way that I think a lot of people do, I'm listening for what's inside the music. His lyrics are different. I mean, he has stories to tell. Um, so, And I might not have known those when I played the tracks because we didn't rehearse as a band. We were in different parts of, uh, we, you know, he brought his tape recorder, his big tape recorder um, to record. And it was an interesting pairing that you, I thought would not, uh, would never be appearing to consider. This is a goth band, right? I don't know where I was, but I, I'm classically trained. I have music of North India running through my veins now. And like with everyone who's asked me to play, I said, let me try this. See, is this, is this on, does this 
make you have the feeling. And uh, sometimes it did. And he let me really go for minutes at a time. I've never had someone who was, who allowed, just let her ramble on, just let her go. And that in itself is a, is a, uh, is a we're very respectful to know. I do that with other musicians too, like same old thing. I'm it, Bobby Thomas, Pam, all the great musicians. You don't tell them what to play. They know it's there. They're just... Okay, we'll take from pocket A, from pocket B. We'll see, you know, you like that. We have things to offer. And Sam was always very appreciative. And he also was very, uh, he was respectful and asking, you've done this, but I really would like to put it in another sequence, what you're playing. And do you want credit for that? Well, I'm going to, you know, cut, paste. Go, no, I went, well, it becomes yours, I said at that time. These are my sounds. This is the sound quality you want. Um, so that's great. So why don't you should take credit for that? I'm just the originator of the sound, like a, a patch. I don't know, but it's real and it comes with whatever I've learned over life. And he respected that and found a place that helped achieve his vision. And I, I liked uh, that I felt good doing that. And sometimes it really went quite off the beaten path. Um, and I wasn't in my mind, I wasn't always sure that why does this work? I didn't quite understand why it worked for him in conveying something because we all have a different little point of view, you know, and he's very artistic in, in many different ways and he can run project. I mean, it's all very impressive what he can do. And um, we did get to play together at a Philadelphia uh, museum where Venus is the primary sculptor, I think, in the in the main hall. Beautiful spot. I thought, this is great. We're actually playing together. How unusual. <laughs> then we scooted on a train to get to a place to play for, um, was it Susie and the Banshees? We were like a warm-up group for them. Oh my God, I had earplugs in. I was still, it's the loudest. Uh, I couldn't hear anything I was playing. I, my fingers were working, uh, but we were in a wall of sound. And I don't know if Sam remembers it or if he's gone deaf too from that, but it was, what? <laughs> but he's he's also been a person, I'm not talking about the music as much, that had, um, he put me in touch with the people. I need CD reproduction. How do I do that? I've never done that. Where do I go? He was very generous with information and uh, in, including me. In fact, maybe it could be that parting the waters get in this one you know this thing by progressive guy uh billboard i'm in there parting the waters is in there and i'm sure i did not have the connection to even submit something so i'm pretty sure that was sam he can correct me if i'm wrong so he was um helpful generous and um i'm not sure why it all gelled well and black tape for Blue Girl worked out, but my kids are really, they're scratching their heads. Mom, you were in the goth band, you know? <laughs> you know? It's definitely that that uh, that anomaly from your discography, uh, especially, you know, the, I mean, Slap too. The I think you played on oh. the, at least the first Slap record, but you played Ooh. a lot more on the black tape for Blue Girl. I, I'm trying to think which elegy for Slap went on forever. I remember that. It was like, it was open. It was just open. Each, you know, each person you play with has, uh, who knows what's going on in their life, what, what, what shapes them, what makes them tick, what they're energized by. And coming, if I was just a classical player, it would be different. But I, I had to work my way up and open to, to do these kind of, uh, all kinds of things in my life. Um, and so each person that came in opened another, oh, it's door number three. Look at that door number four. What's down there? Okay, I might not spend as much time in door, door number four as number two, but it's like I know it's there. Was there a door that you wish would have remained open a little a little longer than it did? Wow, um, I'm I'm not sure. I I guess I thought I'd be I would not retire from playing, but I had to retire from playing. So the the door to playing at at the level with the energy and with enough uh, work in the area, things really changed over time for me. And some of that was a, a physical change. 
um, you know, some are inevitable and some apparently were also inevitable. <laughs> so um, I, I don't know. I have one of my albums uh, is a give back, um, Cleansing Waters, Pura Vida. I'll call this not my music album. Um, although there are two tracks on here I made with uh, Mitch Kopp, um, Metamorphosis, and I forgot what the other one was. There are two just musical tracks, but um, I went through some uh, tough times uh, having a, a cancer diagnosis, and I went through a lot of things for two years, including ooh, a really harsh and long run with chemotherapy. And I pulled on all the things that I had learned in, from chanting from mindfulness, insight, meditation, Korean, Samsung, uh, all the, all uh, Pema Chodron, everything I'd learned from being um, practices to shift the narrative during chemo, which can be a really tough procedure uh, to go through. And I was afraid, I was scared, I was uh, getting weak and debilitated, and, you know, you feel like, are you sure this is going to keep me alive or quite the opposite? So something clicked one day that I need to take control of this, can I? So I, uh, with my uh, friend, Elizabeth, who is a wonderful Iyengar yoga teacher, I asked her to record her voice because she's so good at savasana, which is that very quiet meditative part at the end of yoga classes. I said, I'm writing a script. And we're going to go through cleansing and imagining visualizations using water, waterfalls to cleanse, starting in the brain, each cell, you know, whatever's unnecessary and harmful to wash it out of your system. So it was, um, it was an inspired kind of a recording. And uh, because I really wanted to do a give back with the same kind of diagnosis I had. Um, so there there's a lot behind it so i i uh one of the things i did when i moved out of miami when i was finally well enough and had enough energy and um this was also to be near a child of mine in her high school years i in the berkshire got the opportunity to play for the american cancer society and i i got to um i gave away i made 200 copies and between miami's uh, the what was that the wellness center and people I met doing some of these uh, like look what happens you can survive here I am you can do it you know let's let's encourage you can do it we'll be brave we'll be brave together you know I really love that you share more of the backstory of that recording because it is so different I feel like than a lot of your other releases and music that you've worked on over the years so and for obvious reasons i feel like too from what you've shared so yeah it it was felt necessary go do something good people have been good to you at times you can just get out there you know just i don't know there was no doubt i was going to make it i mean i didn't know if i would have the use of my arms in the same way and so some things changed um so physically there were quite a few side effects that come with chemo and some are permanent. And so that's that kind of led to less playing for me and finally a retirement because you know, I've had hands on for 50 years. Oh my gosh. I was one, one year old when I played. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's not a journey I could have planned. I thought I was going to be an orchestral player. And when I got my first Philharmonic job, I think it just turned 20. Soon thereafter, after playing those pieces, and I said, is that all there is? And no, that wasn't all there was. And I um, I bumped into, or fortuitously bumped into the people I needed who would help. I mean, if, if I hadn't bumped into so-and-so, I wouldn't know that reggae exists. If I hadn't bumped into some, so I wouldn't know any music exists because I was living in a kind of isolated out there until I got out of, of uh my uh my favorite home state i don't know music is a great way to meet people for sure and i i don't know how people get through without it get through life um because i haven't lived that life except as a child and until i got serious all i wanted to do was ice skate ride you know ride horses muck out stalls down at the local stable and 
uh, ride my bike. You know, it was just like very simple. And I'm kind of going back to that now. Um, well, I really appreciate your questions and, you know, uh, the opportunity to speak about um, some uh, family, friends, musicians, uh, journey, uh, fortunate enough to, to have this good life, you know, in music. And I want to thank you as well for allowing me the opportunity to document your life and your experiences and the adventures and journey that you've had. <laughs> but it's been really, it's an unusual moment that, that I got to do this. I, I don't think you uh, and your listeners will know more about me than any one portion band group person knows. It's here and I, that's our real, uh, it's a privilege for me to be able to speak. So I think that this is really great. Thank you um, for the opportunity. And I then we'll do yours and you tell me more about you. <laughs> <laughs> See how much time we got. <laughs> As we kind of close out, uh, any final words you'd like to share before we wrap up? Just go out and listen to nature if you can. Anybody, just go hear it. You'll hear a symphony. I hear a symphony in the trees out here. It depends on when the wind is blowing, which tree it is open ears open ears open hearts